So welcome. Um, my name is Peter Stevenson. I am the Chief Commercial Officer for HSG. And on behalf of Gary, our guest, and my fellow HSG colleagues in the room, just want to welcome everybody. Um, how's the day going? Pretty good so far? Good, good. I know we're in this dangerous window post-lunch. People might, so we're going to try to keep this energy level up. I even have audience participation in a moment, so we'll all get a chance to uh, at least raise our hands. Um, so the title of the session is Why Blind Spots Matter. But really what we're here to talk about today is alignment. Success as a leader really is predominantly around driving alignment, not just with your own role and and how you interact and, and drive your team, but also across stakeholders, and also, frankly, across outcomes. How do you make sure that you are in alignment with all the components of that environment to be successful against your outcomes? And that's not easy. Alignment is really challenging, um, in part because of blind spots. We don't often see <coughs> when we're not in alignment. We don't have mechanisms to actually capture that data and be able to inform our decisions about how we course correct or get to alignment. Welcome. Come on in. No problem. Mm -hmm. So the consequences of alignment or misalignment, frankly, are significant. Um, major system integration project behind schedule over budget, at risk of not even being rolled out. What are the consequences to whatever organization you're working with, uh, you know, and what does that mean? Uh, it could be also dysfunctions on the team um, and, you know, kind of driving siloed behavior, things that are inefficient in terms of getting that level of collaboration and driving that. It could be a funding milestone didn't have the right visibility of the business case across the stakeholders, and they kill the funding. So the consequences are significant. So what, what do you do about that? And so by show of hands, and you could vote more than once, where are the biggest challenges of alignment in your respective organizations? You might be running a major initiative right now or a portfolio initiative. You might be doing a, an organizational transformation. So Misalignment with your team. Who would put that as a high issue in your current environment? Nobody? How about misalignment with stakeholders? Few, good, good. How about misalignment with just the outcome that you're driving? How well is that understood across your team, across those stakeholders? These are all the things that are really, really critical to have some level of, of framework to be able to track and understand so you can make those decisions and get back into alignment. So we have a guest speaker today, and I'd like to introduce him. Gary Meister from Western Digital. Uh, how many people in the room know Western Digital? You're probably using their products. <laughs> Yay. If you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, but they are the largest disk storage manufacturer mm -hmm. in the world. Gary has more than 30 years of leadership at the C level uh, and the executive level, leading multinational teams. And currently is at WD responsible for the uh, Executive Transformation Management Office, driving uh, transformation across WD and all their different divisions and product areas. So through his efforts at WD and the many initiatives that he's led, he has a wealth of wisdom around those blind spots that lead to misalignment. And so we're very, very pleased to have Gary here share a personal story uh, so that all of you can gain from that insight and be able to walk away with some nuggets that you can immediately apply in your own, uh, in your own world. Make sense? Now, on your chair is a framework, and we'll circle back to that at the end of uh, Gary's presentation. But without further ado, Gary. Okay, thank you. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll um, 
be able to work through the post-lunch uh, food, food high and food low uh, with this presentation. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, most of that, you, the, the saying, there's a saying that goes, there's um, a lot of ways to clear a minefield. One of them is stepping on the landmines. Um, so a lot, of, um, a lot of my wealth of experience, as Peter um, described it, comes from stepping on landmines, um, and surviving and, and learning and moving forward. Um, so a little bit about, about Western Digital. I know, I know a lot of you um, raised your hand when, when you talked, when, when, he, when Peter asked about it. So Western Digital um, manufactures, uh, designs, manufactures, and sells hard disk drives, solid state drives. Um, we, we are one of three um, of those kinds of suppliers left. Uh, when we started, there were, there were more than 50. Um, so it, it's a very, very complex, it's a very highly competitive market, highly competitive product line, it's a very complex product. In, in, a, um, in a highly simplified model, there's three rays to the 128th power, uh, different ways you can put a hard drive together. Um, and, and there's only one combination of those that actually uh, causes it to work. Uh, so it's pretty complicated. Um, to get a sense of, of, of how complicated it is, IBM, uh, design, or IBM invented a hard drive back in 1952. Um, at that time, it was uh, six feet high, five feet wide, two feet long, weighed a ton, Store, literally weighed a ton. Um, they manufactured a little over, a little less than 1,100 in a five-year period, um, and it stored four million characters or four megabytes of information. So today, um, we can do a terabyte, weighs a little bit over three ounces, um, and this, so this is a one terabyte, two and a half inch disk drive. A terabyte, for, for those of you who don't know, is a million megabytes. Um, IBM leased their, their hard drive for equivalent of $9,500 a megabyte. Today, this, this sells for about five, one, five thousandths of a cent a megabyte. Um, so, and, and all that comes from technology innovation, product innovation, and, and continuing to move forward from a technology standpoint. So, it, so it's pretty exciting. Um, I was, so I, I was asking Peter if I should uh, give you my analogy of what a megabyte is, and he said it was a little, little dicey, so I'm going to kind of go for it. Um, <laughs> so if, if all of you tweeted three tweets a minute for about an hour, you'd generate a megabyte worth of data. Um, and all that data gets stored on either a hard drive or a solid state drive. Um, so as you can imagine, the storage industry is pretty excited about the, uh, the prospects of the current uh, presidential administration. So um, <laughs> to keep, keep tweeting. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I didn't think everybody would laugh based on what Peter was going to say. Um, so to give you some context for the rest of the presentation, uh, when, when we started in the industry, we, we, our, our business strategy, our model was cost leadership. Um, it, and it was cost leadership because we, we were like the 51st guy into the, the hard drive space. And, and we really couldn't afford to do anything but compete on cost. As a result of that, that we, we became a fast follower from a technology standpoint. And, and, and we enjoyed uh, multiple years of market growth. We, we pretty much got into the business with one product and one market. Uh, as we went along and competitors either went out of business or got acquired, um, it, it, there, there became fewer and fewer people to follow. So we had to, we had to change um, to be, continue to be successful. We had to change our strategy from that of a, a fast follower to a, a product leader. Um, and and what you'll, hopefully what you'll see in, in the next few slides is some of the, some of the landmines that we stepped on on the way to, to making that transition, because um, uh, transitions are hard, change is hard. Um, um, so hopefully you'll be able to see some of that. Um, so as I was trying to reflect on, on some of the things that, that, that can get, that create blind spots, um, I, I settled on, on these four. Um, and they're not in any particular order. Uh, number one is number one because it's more important than number four. It's just, um, it's just on the piece of paper. Um, there are no doubt more, uh, more than these four, but uh, for, for a 20-minute um, conversation, uh, these were the four that I thought were most, um, most relevant. Uh, and you know, so, so the first one, you know, it, it's all about the, the leader, um, humility and courage. So, so humility to know what you know and, and more importantly, know what you don't know. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions to get to, to inform yourself on the things you, do know, you don't know uh, and to validate the things you think you know. Um, so 
it, you know, in, admitting what you don't know for, for a guy is, is harder than asking for directions when you're lost. Um, it, it, it is not easy. And, and for, for, to give you a kind of a stereotypical view of an engineer, because I, I am an engineer, we're, we're capital I introverts. We're kind of off the Myers-Briggs scale from an inter, inter, introversion perspective. So, you know, talking to people you know, isn't something that comes naturally to us, right? So, um, so, so having that, having the courage to say, you know what, uh, in, in, in most of my, let me stop there, right there. In most of my career, I've, I've gotten into roles that I didn't come up through the ranks in. So, uh, I started, when I started at WD, I was, I, I was a test engineering manager. Eventually, I was asked to go run the quality organization. I didn't come up through the quality organization. I kind of got it when it was, uh, when we first got into the dry business. Um, and, and it was something of a mess. Um, I was standing in the wrong place at the right time um, when, when I was asked to go run IT. Uh, and then I became the, the CIO for Western Digital. Um, and I didn't come up through the IT ranks. Uh, eventually, I was asked to go run the hard drive engineering organization. And, and for the first time in my career, I, I knew a little bit about that job because I, I am an engineer and I had been there a, a long time. Uh, but running a 3,000-person engineering organization that had entities across uh, five continents in four different languages was, was, uh, was somewhat daunting. Um, so you really have to have the courage to say, you know what, there's things I know, there's things I don't know, and, and you have to go out and find out uh, you know, what, you, what you don't know. Um, uh, and you'll get interesting responses. Uh, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, but if you always assume that the response is, is intended in a, a positive way and continue to ask questions, um, you'll, you'll get a lot of clarity, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of help along the way. Um, making sure you solve the right problem. So when, when, when I got uh, the engineering role, um, it was, we, we had gone from you know, a one product, one market company to where we had entered just about every market there was for a storage device. Uh, on top of that, those markets, um, s the growth in those markets slowed tremendously. It wasn't, that wasn't a surprise to us. We always knew that, that eventually hard drives were going to be displaced in some markets by solid state drives. Uh, what surprised us was how quickly that happened. Um, so when I got into it, um, one of the first things I was trying to understand is what, what was our record for delivering new products on time and on budget? Uh, and I was surprised to find out that it was zero. Well, we never hit a schedule, we never hit a budget. And it wasn't because we didn't know how to schedule a product or we didn't know how to forecast a schedule for a product. Um, it was, it, it, there was a multitude of, of reasons why that was the case. Uh, so you, you, you had, we, I had to go look, kind of start peeling the onion to find out what was behind all of, all of these schedule misses. And, and one of the things that turned out was um, we, we failed to recognize uh, and do something about the fact that we were moving from a fast follower from a technology standpoint to a product leadership position which required technology leadership. Uh, and and you, you can't manage technology development the same way you manage product development. There's just too many things you don't know about technology. Um, it, on top of that, the, the technology got much, much more complex. Uh, so the lead time for, to develop that technology extended. Um, so while in the past, as a technology follower, we were able to integrate technology into the product during development because the, the technology was already mature. Uh, as a technology leader, that wasn't the case. So we had, a, we had a start sooner on developing technology and, and kind of anticipate what the product needs are for those technology before the product was on the roadmap. Uh, so that when we were at a point where we had to integrate it, uh, it was fairly well along the maturity curve and we could, we could integrate it into the product during the development phase. So each one of those each one of those contributing factors um, had to be uncovered and, and, and understood before we could get uh, could move forward. So, th you know, that, that you know, uh, well, while that isn't necessarily a blind spot, but um, if you're not solving the right problem, you'll end up in a lot of dead ends and, and, and a lot of frustration in the organization because you, 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 you're working on things, but the, the, the needle's not moving, so to speak. We're not getting any better at what we were trying to accomplish. Um, the other thing that, that is, was really important, because uh, as you can imagine, um, 
there was a huge trans transformation required from the way we used to do things to the way we, we had to do things going forward to be successful. Um, so communication was, was, was a huge. Uh, now, in my experience, m most people uh, don't, don't mind change. They, they, there's, there's very few people that think that uh, when they get there, they're not better off than they were w before they started. The, the thing that's painful is the journey, is the path to change. Because um, there's a lot of things that, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of frustration. Um, and, and as it turns out, um, tops down communication to try to get the message, you know, what, what is your vision, where are we going, why do we need to get there? Tops down communication is the most ineffective way to communicate a vision. Because um, what, what, what I found was, and, and our, our organization was fairly large, probably not as large as, as what you guys are dealing with, but fairly large. The, the leadership level kind of gets it, they understand. The, the boots on the ground, the people that actually do, have to do things differently, are completely oblivious to what it is you're trying to do. And, and they are really confused, they're really frustrated. And then the middle management layer, the, the, the people that, you ha that have to go do things differently, are just frozen. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't know where we're headed, uh, they don't know if they're supposed to be doing something different, something uh, the same, so that they're, they, just, they just kind of freeze in their tracks. Um, so, you know, the, uh, another big blind spot is, is, not, is not getting your, your vision or your mission, the new way of doing things uh, across to the people in all layers of the organization. Um, so one of the things that I found that was useful was uh, finding the, the, the so-called hidden influencers. The people in the organization that, that everybody kind of tends to migrate to when they have a question. Uh, and, and spent a lot of time with those people making sure they understood what was going on in my head, where I was going, and why we needed to, to change. Because I knew they would go out and they would start talking about it. And, and I knew that when people came to them to say, what, you know, what the heck is he talking about? What, why, would he, why do we need to do this? They would have the right answer. Uh, and, then the, and then communication and, and clarity makes its way all the way down to the, the kind of execution layer, if you will, in the organization. And then the other thing, um, y you have to celebrate wins. Um, simply changing direction is not going to change people's behavior. Um, it, particularly in an organization uh, like, like I was in, where um, change was hard, and there was more people in the organization that were, that, whose ideas were not listened to or not taken into consideration. So, they, so what happens when, you, when, when that's the case? People stop talking. People stop coming up with new ideas on how to do things. People stop trying to change, uh, change the way things were done so that we can do things better and more, effect more effectively in the future. Um, so by celebrating wins, making them public, when you actually have initiated a change and it's, it's caused a, a difference in, in what we do, making sure everybody knows that that just happened. Uh, and that way, people will eventually, it, it doesn't have, it's not like a light switch. Um, it, you know, people will eventually start seeing that, hey, th this is for real, it's not just another fad, I'm not gonna wait this one out like I did the other six uh, change initiatives. Um, that, that, that things are changing and people are making a difference and, and it'll start breaking through that, that, um, that reluctance, if you will, to bring ideas to the table. Because uh, the answer is out there. People in the organization knew what the, what the answer to the problems were. Uh, they were just waiting for somebody to ask them and, and so waiting for somebody to actually listen to them, but more importantly. Um, now, this, this is a huge one, maintaining alignment with the team. Um, another another uh, opportunity for blind spots. Um, so I had been in the organization for many, many years. I had known most of the people that were now part of my staff for many, many years. Um, they had a view of me in different roles that turned out to be not true. Uh, some of it turned out to be not true. Um, some of it turned out to be true, uh, much to their chagrin. Um, and, and I had a view of them uh, in, in their roles. Um, so, uh, the, so, the, so that, that view comes with a set of biases and a set of assumptions 
uh, about how they work together, how they act as individuals, how they interact with the people underneath of them uh, in their organizations, um, so on and so forth. Um, it, it, and it's, uh, it's probably one of the biggest sources of blind spots that I've run into. And, and I'll, show you, I'll show you what I mean on the next, on the next page. Um, along the way, um, I realized that um, you, you really need to take action on people who aren't in the right roles quickly, um, and which, is, which is completely counter to the way I, and you know, David Morris, who worked with me on this, reminds me of this every time I see him. My natural instinct is to try to, want to, 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 to try to fix the person or fix the problem by, you know, is it, is it the right person in the wrong job? Is it the right person, right job, but um, skills deficiency? So I tend to hold on to, to, hold on to people longer than um, I should. Not, and it's a very hard thing to do. Um, now, having said that, I don't want you to think I'm off firing people left and right. In, in my 30-year career at, at Western Digital, I've only fired one person. Uh, now, I've moved people around where they were not effective in, in the job they were in, but they were very, very effective in a different job, or helped them get skills that they needed to be successful in the role they were in. Uh, but but you, you, can't, uh, what, you can't take a long time to figure out whether people are in the right spot or not. Uh, a, a huge, a huge uh, lesson learned for me. Um, and, and then the, the common theme across the organization, uh, particularly in an engineering kind of role, uh, autonomy, mastery, purpose are, are what really got people out of bed in the morning, you know, hate, hate Fridays, love Mondays, come in early, stay late uh, kinds of things. They, they wanna know where are you going? What's my role in that, in that journey? Uh, and and what, is, what is it that you expect me to accomplish in the position that I am in? And then get out of the way. Well, let, them, let them figure out how they're going to get uh, from where they are to where you want them to be. Um, so this is um, what I mean by uh, a host of, of, of blind spots. I don't know if you can see this in the back of the room. So there are circles, and the circles are what the, the team's self-assessment along various dimensions are. And then there's a, an L. A, an L was what I thought um, of what the team, where the team was at along those dimensions. Um, I don't know if you can see that in the back. But anyway, so there, there were a couple places at the top of the chart where we were pretty, pretty closely aligned. Uh, there were other places in that chart where we were not. We were on opposite eight, uh, opposite ends of the of the spectrum. Um, things like, um, and I came shared vision and goals. Uh, now this survey, this assessment was done three months after I rolled out with that my leadership team and the layer below them. What where we were headed, why I thought it was important, and and what kind of the consequences of not getting there were. So I thought we were pretty well aligned. Then we did the assessment three months later, and we found out that we're not it's huge, right? Uh, so, so I could have gone. I could have gone off thinking that they had it. They were going with. They were driving it into their organizations. And until we did the assessment, I found out that I had a lot more work to do. I think it comes back to that c c communication thing. Um, but um, and, uh, so competency and skills. Um, I, I thought we had the right people in the right place. Their own self-assessment said nah, that's probably not true. Um, th that's their self-assessment. Um, one of the big ones, healthy conflict uh, and, and um, trust. Um, so w along the way, I, I, I discovered that um, people, leader, leaders, it, it, my direct reports, were behaving in ways that other people, uh, other of my direct reports, had problems with. But they, they, they never confronted, if you will, the person's behavior. They never held that person accountable for their behavior. More importantly, held them accountable for the impact that behavior was having on the rest of the organization. So what, what the assessment helped me do was, was be able to hold a mirror up and say, look, um, this is what you guys said about yourselves. Um, this is, th th and these are things that are going to prevent us from being successful going forward. Y you have to all feel comfortable with each other to the point where if somebody that said, does something, says something, acts a certain way that you don't appreciate, y you, have to be, you have to trust them enough, trust yourself enough to be able to, to confront that behavior in a healthy way 
I'm not talking about fisticuffs or calling people names. I'm just talking about, yeah, you just did something I don't like, and here's the impact it had on me. And, so I, and, and these are vice president level people in the organization, people who I thought had been ra around long enough that I didn't need to, it, to, to teach them this or to hold this in front of them, if you will. Um, and then toward the, the things in, in, uh, in the red are group norms and communication. A again, it's the, the group norms are things around you know, behavior, how we expect you to act and, and um, how you, versus how you actually are acting. So th this was a, a huge spotlight for me on what I needed to do from a team standpoint in order for us to be successful at, at making that transition uh, from you know, fast follower, um, cost leadership to technology leadership um, and, and product leadership and, and how, how, things had, had a how things had to change going forward to be successful. Um, so how did we do? Um, so uh, in a fairly short period of time, we were able to separate uh, technology development from product development, both from a, a resource, a people resource perspective, and a, a budget perspective. So we actually carved out enough budget from the, uh, fr from the overall engineering spend to be able to, to launch new technology-only staging products so that we could um, mature those technologies in advance of the product that actually needed them. Um, we, we, we developed and uh, implemented a new, scheduler, a, new, a new project scheduling forecast process that where it used to be tops down based on, well, the last product we did that looked like this took about this much time, so this one's going to take about that much time too. And that's why, that's one of the con contributing factors to zero percent schedule attainment. To more of a bottoms up, where the people that actually had to do the work were making the commitments on when they were going to have that work completed. Uh, and that way when, when, when something that was uh, not expected to happen happened and schedule delays were, were at risk or schedules were at risk, uh, the organization that committed the schedule had more ownership in the result than because it was their commitment. Uh, we were holding each other accountable to, if you said you were going to do it, I don't want to hear how hard it is, I want to hear how much, how much longer you have to work. Go, go, go meet the commitment you just made to the organization. Whereas in a tops-down scheduling mode, tops-down forecasting mode, if, if something happened that we didn't expect, very, very easy for uh, pieces of the organization to say, you know what, I, I never committed that schedule in the first place, so I, I don't feel bad that it's now late. Um, and, and then we address the, the, the team leadership dynamics. And, and here we actually, uh, I actually moved people around. Um, I split some organizations up because um, the, uh, there, there was too much responsibility in one place, so I split it up and moved some people um, out um, and, and made some changes in that regard. Um, so we delivered uh, the very first product that we launched with this new um, product uh, scheduling process in the separated technology development. Uh, it actually came out when we said it was going to come out. It's not when marketing asked for it, but what, what my goal was was if I said it was going to come out in 18 months, it came out in 18 months. 17 or 16 was better, 18 was okay. 19 was unacceptable. So we, we delivered the product that we said we were going to deliver when we said we were going to deliver it. Um, and then established that, that standard for, um, for expectations going forward from the engineering organization. Um, so I mean, that, that's kind of the 20 minute version of a two and a half year journey. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than, than, I've, than I've shared here um, for time's sake, but um, so those were some of the, the kind of lessons learned and, and landmines I stepped on as I was going through this transformation. Okay. Thank you, Gary. So we, we do have a little bit of time uh, set aside for questions and answers. I'm sure as Jer Gary uh, shared some highlights from that journey, might make some connections to your own environment. You might have some follow-up. So just... Uh, Raise your hand and go. Any questions? I think you had a, a very important point that you made about rallying the team. Um, encouraging the heart, I think, is really um, critical. You know, getting the teams to be aligned and high functioning. 
So um, can you describe some of the things that you did to kind of build upon uh, those efforts and build a cohesive team? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so uh, great question. Um, uh, the, you know, it, it kind of starts with, for, for me, it, it started with uh, setting an expectation of how I, uh, how I expected people to work. Uh, and, and I call it um, working horizontally across the organization. So, so horizontally meaning, um, you know, in, in a hard disk drive or a solid state disk drive, there's, there's a lot of different subsystems. There's electrical, mechanical, um, servo, so on and so forth. And, and um, each one of those subsystems is done in an organization or a vertical, but it all has to come together for the product to work. Um, so, it, so it's setting an expectation about uh, how I expected people to work in the organization to get work done. Um, and then, um, to, to be perfectly candid, there was a lot of um, a lot of my personal involvement in in product meetings, design reviews, and, and things like that to make sure that um, that that progress was being made and how I expected people to, to work with each other. And it, it's not I'm not a I'm not what you would consider a micromanager. Um, it, I'm more of a set the context, you understand what I said, you understand where we're headed, you get your role in that, and then you know, let me know when you, if you need any help. Um, but in, in a change like this, where, where behaviors had to mo be modified, um, I spent a lot of time working with all layers, of, you know, uh, all layers of the organization, the leadership level as a team, leadership level as in one-on-ones, um, round tables with some of the, the, the boots on the ground, so to speak, the, the folks, so, so that I, I made sure that they were hearing it directly from me, what I expected um, of the, the management layers above them. Uh, and, and giving them permission to say, look, if you, if, if you see things different, if you see things working differently than I just described, I, I, I need to know that. And, you know, it, it's, just, you know it's, it's, it's just between you and I. Nobody's ever going to... Uh, know that you told me something uh, but it was it's a lot of hands-on a lot of a lot of going around talking to people a lot of testing to make sure that um, things were going the way I, I i had expected them to go in my head right because the, the picture in my head was perfectly clear getting out of my mouth is not always <laughs> any other questions yes i don't need a mic yeah. <laughs> accountability is um, huge Accountability is crucial for many organizations. Um, and how do you address the blind spots where you have people in the organization that are accountability adverse? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it, it, um, not giving them an opportunity to shy away from it if they failed. Because um, a lot of, a lot of yeah, I, I, I said I, in my 30 years in, at WBA, I've only fired one person, only let go one person. A lot of other people self-selected out um, because it, it, we, set it ex we set an expectation that, it, you know, if, if you're an engineer in the servo area and you said you're going to deliver a servo design in six months, we're not going to wait six months to find out whether you did that or not. But you know, if, you're, if you are not going to deliver or you're going to miss your commitment, you, we're not going to let you hide. Uh, and, and in the peer pressure alone, um, I mean, it was it was tremendous. Um, so you know, we just we just we just said you're going to be accountable for you know your your commitments to the organization and to each other, and then just you know kind of hold that so up in front of them. Goal dilution and that nope. 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 And that role role dilution. I don't mean to point at you, but um, role role dilution. Um, I had one one VP in my organization. Um, that, that was constantly going down into another person's organization and talking to the, like, the director level or the people below them. It, it, and in some cases, what he was trying to get done was counter to what the person in charge of that organization was trying to get done. It, and it was, look, you, you, your, your relationship is with the vice president of that organization. You cannot go to his people or her people and, and um, advance what you want to have done. You need to take that uh, to, the, to your peer in the organization. So, so, so 
Well, well, not necessarily a, a, a perfect example of role dilution. It was, it was making sure that, that people were working at the right level. And that, um, in fact, the, the, the person I'm thinking of was, was part of the program management organization. Um, what, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest changes for them was you're responsible for schedule and overall cost of the product. Um, the person in charge of firmware is responsible for the firmware piece of that. So if that person says it's going to take six months, but you think it's going to take four, it's six, because that's that person's job. That's not your job. Um, so and that was that was a big change for that individual. Uh, but you know he he got it and eventually um, came around to my way of thinking, so to speak. <laughs> um, but there, you know a lot of people self-select out because they 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 either don't want to or can't work in a, a new environment like that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good we had one more? Yeah, on your chart, why you have kind of a, <clears throat> a variance between what you think and what your team thinks. Um, did you share that with the yes, team? Yes, absolutely. And then, um, was there some sort, form of, say, um, storming that occurred out of the gate because um, just the, kind of the exposure and the differences where both people were at? Yeah, great question. So the question was, did I share these results with the team? Um, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, and, and, and they knew before they took the assessment that, that we were going to go through the results as a team. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was, it was, um, was kind of eye-opening to everybody, including me. I mean, I thought I was more in tune with where they were at than it turns out that I actually was. Um, but it, you know, it, it's just one of those things where it, um, individually they all kind of knew where the dysfunction was, but for whatever reason, um, they weren't addressing the dysfunction. They were just kind of trying to work around it, work through it. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was, it was. I think the first meeting was like four hours long, but that was it was there was several. Um, it was it was a topic of discussion, at least once a week in the staff meetings. Um, until until they got to a point where they told me, we don't need to talk about this with you anymore. We've got this. <laughs> and, and I knew I knew then that okay, <laughs> I can go move on to something else. But it, I mean, it was un it was uncomfortable. But you know, it was I was I was as transparent as I, I knew how to be. That you know, here's what I'm going to do with the information, and we're going to solve this to get whatever the results are. We're gonna we're gonna review together, and we're gonna figure out what to do about it together. Well, thank you for your questions, and thanks again very much to Gary for uh, going through all that and sharing some of those key points. If you can go to the pyramid slide. So one of the things we promised uh, as part of this session was a framework to think about alignment um, as you're driving the most critical outcomes for your organization and trying to get to that top of the pyramid, which is success. And if I've Paraphrase for Gary, that was on time, on budget, you know, at, you know, at or uh, in front of schedule, a new culture for that organization, making that strategic shift from a uh, fast follower to a technology leader. Um, but this framework is laid out um, to help you think through all the dimensions of alignment. So at the bottom, you have the accountability owner. Uh, they fund it. They, they are the sponsor. They are the ones that maybe have established that vision and absolutely want to see that outcome achieved. And they oftentimes uh, appoint the leader or it's clear in the organization who's going to lead that. But if you think about this, the reason why the leader, the stakeholder, and the delivery team are all encompassed within that outcome is because that represents the dimensions of where misalignment could occur. And you see all the different colored dots on the blind spots. And as, as Gary suggested, you know, obviously in, in that purple category, which is humility and courage for him, it was a blind spot that he learned uh, to address through looking in the mirror and how important that was to be able to then affect change in, in his organization. Similarly, make sure we are solving the right problem. This is oftentimes not an easy exercise. Uh, people struggle with actually clearly defining what is the outcome we're going for and is it the right outcome and the environment's dynamic so that outcome that you might have started with could change or need to change. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, stakeholders, teams, 
uh, the dimensions that you talked about, a uh, top-down is about the most ineffective. So how do you connect with those influencers at all levels within the organization? How do you make sure you keep not only the accountability owner, your most critical stakeholder, but all the other stakeholders that are going to be either potential beneficiaries of that outcome or potential enablers of that outcome? And if I, again, I didn't talk about this uh, when I should have, but th uh, there, there's two kinds of uh, hidden influence. There's, a, there's the positive guy, the positive ones and the negative ones. Um, I, you need to know both of them. Like the positive one is you want to bring into the fold so that they are sending the right message. And, and the negative one, is you, you want to make sure that uh, you either keep them away <laughs> uh, or find a way to turn them into positive influences. But you, but you, need, to, you need to know both. Excellent. Sorry. No problem. And then finally, uh, maintain alignment with your team. Part of that is making sure people are in their right roles, the roles that they uh, self-reflect that are uh, energizing the most uh, in line with their experience or skill set, and they understand that role. Um, all of these then represent kind of the, the cornerstones of different aspects of alignment that need to be managed on an ongoing. That's why the arrows are looping because that path towards success doesn't just stop with, oh, let me take, let me get some data on where the team is right now. Things change, dynamics change, people come and go, uh, external factors come into play. You need a system really that is ongoing, that is collecting that data and information. And so this framework is meant so that you can think about it in your own context and take away with, uh, you know, aspects that you may want to consider going forward. So thank you for uh, attending. We hope this was helpful. Uh, two things. Um, first of all, that chart is also on your seat. There is a uh, request that you fill out a uh, uh, you know, kind of feedback. Let us know how this went and whether or not it hit your expectations. And uh, we will certainly, my colleagues and I will be around if you have any other questions as well as Gary. Okay, thanks.